Well, I'm giving everybody a chance to tear me a new one. I'm, by invitation, wading into a debate over something that I don't really know a great deal about. I've got a working knowledge, or my understanding, cursory of Kant and Kantian ethics. It's not something I've really gotten into. I have kind of an evolved ethical system, but it's more to do more to do with um, um, virtue ethics than deontology. But in any case, here goes. Um, my issue is kind of similar to in Mendham's with, um, with duty-based ethics or duty-based ethics that assume that one wants to do the right thing. Um, for example, you know, you're supposed to act in the Kantian imperative, you're supposed to act in such a way that it would adhere to a universally applicable law, something like that, phrasing it weirdly, but... Um, okay, so let's say that I have absolute knowledge of good and evil or right and wrong. I shouldn't say good and evil, but the right and the wrong way to live according to the universal principle. Um, why should I choose the right one? Why should I follow that principle? What's in it for me? Or, or, or not even what's in it for me. Give me a motive for following the right principle, the universal law. Well, I guess, you know, there's one way to look at universal laws in Mendham style. Follow the universal law or you're just a horrible pile of bleepity bleepity bleep that deserves to have bleep shoved up your bleep and all this kind of thing. Um, okay, <laughs> isn't that a great reason to be ethical? Be ethical or else. Um, that's kind of, if you ask me, implicit in the application of Kantian ethics. You work out a really fancy intellectual system of ethics, and you go, okay, this is great. This is a great way to um, act ethically or a great ethical foundation for society because I've worked it all out. Now you go to apply it to the society to which it's meant to be applied. Good luck with all that. Um, most people don't bother to think through their ethics, so how are you going to impose a, de a, a deontological set of ethics on them? Well, you set up the Spanish Inquisition or... Catholic school system or something like that to brainwash everybody into thinking this way to make sure that they do so in a knee-jerk kind of fashion because really they can't be expected to work all this stuff out in their heads. So we just reach for the guilt, reach for the fear, reach for the shame, reach for all this other stuff that we use normally to motivate people, even greed I guess you can use. And that's how you get people to do the right thing as established by the categorical imperative, which most people don't understand and don't want to take the time to understand. Um, that's my objection to it. It kind of mirrors in Mendham's. Um, I'm not saying that it, it, it doesn't work, but what I'm saying is you can't really apply it universally. Um, it doesn't work that way. It all depends on the circumstances in which each individual person finds themselves. What if you haven't even worked out an ethical code for yourself? How do you know what is right and wrong? Or, you know, what if this has never occurred to you? What's society going to do with somebody who doesn't believe in right and wrong? Well, you reach for the thumb screws, right? You know, as I said, you you can say, look, I've, bo I've worked this out. You haven't. You can't even be bothered to do it. So if you can't be bothered to work out your own ethics, then I'm going to impose my ethics on you, whether you understand them or not. Um, <clears throat> that's traditionally how ethics get imposed upon society, by ivory tower types, right? Um, look at the way Lenin and Stalin attempted to impose the ethics of communism on Russia. Look, we understand all of this. You don't. So do as we say, because we're right. And then you've got, you know, the, the, the priesthood emerging which, as I said, which, you know, certain streams of misanthropy or misanthropic philosophies are basically the emergence of a denunciatory priesthood, right? Um, that's one objection. The other objection is, again, it's kind of implicit in the first. How do I know what the right thing is? Um, where does this deontology come from? The ethics that is outside of myself. You know, where are you going to work that out? Um, you know, where, where's this sort of, you know, where do the Ten Commandments come from? Well, we work them out ethic or sorry, rationally. Okay, you work them out rationally, but then you've got to apply them to the real world. You know, it's, 
it seems nebulous. You know, it seems like there's some sort of outside force that acts upon you that enables you to act ethically in a deontological ethical system. I, again, I go for virtue ethics, generally speaking. Although there's a certain amount of deontology in what I'm in, in my in my ethical position as well, um, I tend to sort of say that necessity is where both come from. Um, what am I? What is the universe? What is me? And what is all the other stuff? You know, then what's the interactions between the two, right? Um, if I am A, then I act in, a, in accordance to the nature of being an A, uh, but I have to somehow balance that with the interests or the fact that I have to interact with something external to A, which is necessity, but even my position as an A or as A um, is predicated on necessity as well. It's summed up, and again I keep bringing this up, as the uh, in the um, the despondency of Arjuna. That's essentially my ethical position. Arjuna's through a crazy series of events find him, finds himself in a horrible nightmarish situation. He has to go into this titanic world changing cataclysmic battle, the battle of eternity, the battle of, you know, the greatest battle ever that could ever be. And he and he's fighting against people that he does not want to fight against. He's not fighting against easily identified bad people. He's fighting against people that is morally ambiguous whether he should be fighting them at all, but it's also morally ambiguous whether he should refrain from fighting with them at all. He doesn't know what to do. What then shall we do? And he seizes up. Well, Krishna sort of explains to him, What are you, Arjuna? Well, he says, I'm a warrior prince, etc., etc. No, in what way are you a warrior prince? Well, I was born that way, you know. Um, I, no, 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 no. I'm talking about right now. In what way are you now a warrior prince? Necessity. All that's in your past is necessity. Think, I guess, Epictetus, right? Um, right now you're dealing with a necessity, which is your past, which you have no control over now. You have really no control over your present. Think hard determinism. Everything that is past is necessity. All your options in front of you are necessity, right? The options in front of you are necessity. You don't like the fact that you've been maneuvered by apparently external forces into a position where you have to make an insane moral choice. Um, but you're here now. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to act in accordance to your position here as sort of a, I don't know, a player on a stage um, that a, a hand that has been dealt to you not by yourself but by necessity? How are you going to come to terms with that fact? And also, how do you remain true to yourself? How do you remain a virtuous person in your own eyes? Um, that's what, again, the whole Bhagavad Gita is out to teach people. How do you act in a virtuous manner and take into consideration necessity at the same time? Necessity brings your duties with you. You just look around your life. What are, what are my duties, for example? I have a duty to go to work because I have a duty to provide for my family because I freely accept that duty. I have the option at any time, as does Arjuna, of walking away from my entire life. But I choose not to do it walking away from my my job, my family, my friends, all this, I can just pfft, gone and just shirk it all at any given moment. Any of us have this capacity. Why don't we do it? Because we freely accept the duties that are incumbent upon this. There are people who live completely atomistic lives, who shut themselves into their houses and don't deal with people at all. And But you can say that that's... Um, They've sort of abdicated their duty, but again, they may consider themselves to have a negative duty to not be out there doing things to uh, disrupt the world. I don't know. But duty, I think, comes not from birth, not from some mythology, not from some, even from your, your station in society or whatever. It simply comes from necessity. Where are you right now? Right now. This very second. 
Where are you? That's necessity. That's where your virtues, vices, duties, all that sort of thing come from. Um, it's more ontological, but it's also deontological. It's kind of a fusion of the two. Indian ethics are interesting in, in that they don't really make that great of a distinction, or they fuse the two, I suppose. Uh, virtue versus deontological ethics. Um, and I think Kant sort of just sort of says what you as a member of society have, has to do. To simplify it, Kant deals with a third person position. Indian ethics deal basically with a first person perspective. Kant says what do you, how should you behave as a member of society? And um, as a member of society, as seen from the third person, and Indian ethics, and to a certain extent virtue ethics, say, how should you behave ethically in this world from a first person perspective? That's the difference, in my view. Again, I'm no authority on Kant, so feel free to lay right into me on this. <laughs>